Welcome to MoviMod and Field Distributors Basic and Intermediate Training. This is Session 7. We've explored our MoviMod and Expert Mode, and now we're going to move on to a tool that's available through MoviTools Motion Studio called the Scope. So what is the Scope exactly? As I said, it's a tool built into MoviTools Motion Studio. It has a wide variety of functions. We're going to take a look at a few of these. The scope tool works like a multi-channel bench oscilloscope in triggered capture mode. Triggered capture mode, if you don't know, is a mode that laboratory oscilloscopes have where the oscilloscope, instead of simply displaying the data coming in on its individual channels, waits for an event to happen. And when the event happens, it captures a snapshot of all the channels for a brief period of time. Common things that we do with the scope built into MovieTools Motion Studio include confirming that everything is working. We monitor various parameters. We look at them on the scope to confirm that everything is okay. You can use it for optimizing performance where we're trying to make something work really well and we need to examine some parameters to make sure that the response is the one we want. The scope is used to identify abnormal behavior. If your application is doing something a little strange, sometimes it's helpful to monitor certain parameters, look at them on the scope, and that will reveal an adjustment that might need to be made. And then finally, the scope is often used for troubleshooting difficult faults. We'll take a look at how to do that before we're finished with this session. Let me give you an overview of the scope. This is the scope. You can see it looks very much like a traditional bench oscilloscope. It's actually built into the MoviMod. It really isn't built into MoviTools Motion Studio exactly. The front end is part of MoviTools Motion Studio, the part that you see here that displays the data, but the actual scope hardware is within the MoviMod itself. The advantage of this is that the scope doesn't require the PC connected to the MoviMod to actually collect data. The scope can collect data whether a PC is connected up to it or not. The PC is basically just used for setting up the scope and then later coming back to download the data, display it, and analyze it. So you can see the advantage of this is that you can set up the scope using your PC, then you can disconnect and walk away and come back at a later date to collect the data. This is really useful when you're trying to track down an elusive fault. You can configure the scope with your PC, then you can walk away, wait for the fault to happen, come back with your PC, download the data, display it, and analyze it. So having the scope built into the MoviMod really is helpful. The scope can monitor up to eight parameters at once. So it's sort of like an eight channel bench oscilloscope. That's actually pretty good. In most cases, you won't need to monitor eight parameters, but they are available if you need them. I'll also mention the scope is a little bit quirky. It is kind of cantankerous at times, and I'm going to show you some of the ways you can work around those quirks. Before we get into setting up the scope, I want to explain in greater detail how it works, because I think if you understand how it works, some of the setup is going to make a lot more sense. If you've not worked with a laboratory oscilloscope before, pay a special attention here because scopes really are rather complicated and understanding what's going on under the hood really will help you to use this tool to best effect. So let's talk about what's inside. Remember, this is built into the MoviMod. First of all, there is hardware built into the MoviMod that captures data from various parameters. I'm kind of likening this to a camera. It's able to capture information about parameters and turn those into numbers. So we have our parameters connected up to the capture hardware. You can monitor up to eight. I'm showing just four here to make it a little simpler. These parameters are actually very revealing about what's going on inside the MoviMot, so they're commonly used when trying to track something down or just monitor the performance of the device. So they're connected up to the capture hardware, which can turn the information from them into numbers. It then feeds those into the scope memory. The scope has eight channels of memory, one for each parameter that it's monitoring. In this case, I'm only showing four because we're only monitoring four parameters. So the scope memory can hold the numbers generated by the capture hardware. So what happens when the scope is operating 
It takes a snapshot of each monitored parameter and then stores the values in its memory. So this is kind of what it looks like when it's operating. You can see it's going through, it's taking snapshots of those four parameters and then dumping the numbers into memory sequentially. And this just goes on and on and on. So that's kind of the operation of the scope. This happens in the background within the MovieMot. Now the rate at which it's taking those snapshots is called the sample rate. It determines how often the scope is taking the snapshots and dumping them into memory. The faster the sample rate, the better quality representation it's producing of the parameters. But the memory is relatively small, so the faster the sample rate, the faster you fill up the memory. As you can guess, setting the sample rate is something of an art where you strike a compromise between quality and length. We'll talk about that more as we go along. Now, let me explain something else about how the scope handles its memory. I'm going to show just a single channel of scope memory. When the scope is idle, it's actually working, so the scope is never truly idle. What it does, it simply endlessly fills its channel memory using a technique called circular buffering. Let me show you how that works. The memory starts filling up like this, and then it comes to the end, and it goes back to the beginning, and then it starts overriding the oldest data first. It just keeps going around in a circle, as you can see. While the scope is doing this task, just endlessly going round and round and round, filling and overriding its memory, it's doing something else. It's watching for an event called the trigger. The trigger basically tells the scope something important just happened, and now instead of just idly collecting data and overwriting it, we're now going to preserve the data because this is going to give us the context surrounding that event, that trigger event. Let me show you how this works. When the trigger occurs, the scope continues collecting snapshots until it reaches what's called the pre-trigger percentage location, at which point it stops collecting data. Now, you may wonder, what's the pre-trigger percentage? This is a value you dial in when you're configuring the scope. It basically says how much of the data before the trigger event you want to keep and how much data after the trigger event you want to keep. So this is actually a percentage. You can set it. Let me just give you an example. Let's say we want to make the pre-trigger 20% and the post-trigger 80%. What that means is the scope is going to preserve 20% of the memory before the trigger happened and 80% after. Let's see this happening here. The scope is collecting data. It's just going around in a circle, watching for the trigger, and boom, there's the trigger. All right, something happened that we now care about. We now want to stop just going around and around and around in memory. What we want to do now is start preserving what's in memory. So what's going to happen since our pre-trigger is set to 20%, the scope is going to mark 20% of the data before the trigger for preservation. So 71 and 33 represent 20% of this data, so it's going to preserve that. And then it's going to continue collecting data until it comes back to the beginning of the pre-trigger data. So the stuff in blue here is post-trigger, and it stops here. It does not continue to overwrite the pre-trigger data. Basically, at this point, our memory is full. We've collected all the information we can, and the trigger event is what made all this happen. Now, when you come back later with MobyTools Motion Studio, plug into the MobyMod, and download the data, what will happen is MobyTools Motion Studio is going to organize the data in the correct order with the trigger identified. So it's going to start with the pre-trigger, 71, 33, 11 is the trigger, and then all the post-trigger data, and that's the full amount of memory. So that represents one channel worth of data. And then finally, what the scope is going to do in Motion Studio, it's going to graphically display it as a trace on the screen. And you can use that trace to visually see what was happening with that parameter over that period of time. By the way, you can save these traces to a file. They can be emailed for analysis by a specialist. 
Let's say you're working out in the field, you've got a weird Movimot problem, so you do a scope trace, you save it to a file. Maybe you're in contact with an SCW EuroDrive regional engineer. You can email that file, and the engineer can then look at that and figure out what's going on and give you some help solving your problem. This is very frequently done. I'll also point out there are things called cursors, which are movable. You can move them around the screen to different points on the trace, and you can take measurements at specific locations, and that too can be helpful. I will be demonstrating that before this session is over. All right, so that's kind of how the scope works. I hope that made sense. As I said, if you're familiar with oscilloscopes, you probably found that familiar. But if that topic is new to you, and maybe you found it a little confusing, Watch this section again and then go on and we'll actually see it work when I demonstrate the scope. Let's talk about the scope itself, how you set it up in MobyTools Motion Studio. You do most of your controlling the scope through its toolbar. It's got a very long one, so I've split it up into two sections here, but it's just one long one across the top of the screen. Probably the most important button is this one here. It's sort of a dial kind of button. It's used to configure the scope. And then this button here readies the trigger. It's sort of like cocking a gun, getting it ready to fire. It's telling the scope to start watching for the trigger. There's also a button that you can force a trigger where if you click it, it will just trigger the scope right then. You can cancel the trigger as well. And then you have these status indicators which tell you what the scope is doing. If the green light is on, it means the scope is watching for a trigger. It's ready to be triggered. When the red light turns on, it means the scope has been triggered and it's collecting data. The yellow light isn't really that useful, so I ignore that most of the time. The green and the red ones are really the ones of interest. And then finally, this button is very important. This is the one that tells MoviTools Motion Studio to download the scope's data out of the MoviMot and display it on the screen. These are regular file controls. You can save and load traces. We have some buttons for scaling the trace on the screen. We have some buttons for the cursors for taking measurements, and we have a few for zooming in and out of the trace. All right, so let's look at the scope setup screen. You're going to spend a lot of time on this, and of course this screen is crucial because this is where you get the scope ready to do what you want. You can see it's got a lot of different things on it, so let's go through these one by one. First of all, here are the eight parameters. You pick these with the pull-down list. You do not have to pick eight. You can pick just one if you want. I have two of them selected here. You can also see their different colors, and that will be the color of the trace on the screen. Then there's the sample rate dial. This can be set anywhere between one millisecond and 1,000 milliseconds, or one second. As I've said, this affects the quality of the trace. The smaller the number, the better quality the trace, but the shorter amount of time you have. And by the way, here's where you find out how much time you get. You can see here if I set the sample rate to one sample every 5 milliseconds, you have 10,240 milliseconds, or 10.24 seconds total capture time. That may be enough for what you're doing, but if it isn't, you'll need to set the sample to a larger value the quality will go down a bit. So again, this is kind of a balancing act. Next is the pre-trigger slider. By sliding this back and forth, you set the pre-trigger and post-trigger percentages. Right here, it's set to 10%, which means that 10% of the data in the buffer comes from before the trigger event, 90% comes after. So how you slide this depends on what you're doing. And then finally, all these remaining controls are to select the trigger source, what starts the capture, in other words. And you can have multiple trigger events operating at once, and if any one of those events occurs, it will start the scope preserving data. Let's talk about pre- and post-trigger percentages for a second, because this is probably the trickiest part to set, because you really have to make a judgment call here. The rule is set the pre- and post-trigger percentages to emphasize what you're interested in. So, for example, if you set the slider this way, 90% of the data comes before the trigger and 10% after. You would set it this way to emphasize things that are leading up to the trigger event. In other words, you care what happened before the trigger, 
you're not that interested in what happens afterwards. This is often used when you're tracing faults because the trigger is the fault. You care about what happened before the fault, really not too much after it. But you can do the opposite, and there are situations that you might do that where you might set it this way, where the pre-trigger is 10% and the post-trigger is 90%. 10% of the data you see on the screen comes from before the trigger event, 90% comes after. This emphasizes what happens after the trigger event. If you're doing general purpose monitoring, you probably will set the trigger this way so that you start up the scope and then you collect data for a while and you look at what happens. Or you could set it somewhere in between. In this case, we have it set to 50%, which means 50% of the data comes before the trigger and 50% after. What it's doing here, it's going to show what surrounds the trigger event. So you can set that slider anywhere you like just set it to emphasize what you're interested in. Now, a helpful tip. This is part of the quirkiness that I mentioned the scope has. When you go into the setup screen, if you've made any changes, in order to make them stick, you should click the Start button, wait 10 seconds, then click the Cancel button, and that will make those settings stick. Once you've done that, you can click Close. Okay, that's just something you have to do. It's one of the scope's quirks. I'll demonstrate this in just a few minutes. All right, we're going to look at two scenarios here. I'm going to give you two demonstrations. The first one is monitoring with the scope. You would do this if you simply want to watch how the MoviMot's behaving when it's controlling the application. So this is kind of just classic oscilloscope monitoring. Now, how would you set this up? Well, of course, you would go into your setup screen and you would do the following things. First, you'd pick the parameters you care about. Then you would select one of the digital inputs to be the trigger. I've selected the clockwise digital input and I've picked the rising edge. In other words, when it goes from the off condition to on, as soon as that happens, it will trigger the scope. So I'm waiting for a clockwise signal to come through to start the drive and then that would act as the trigger. So that's one way to trigger the scope. There are other ways, but this is a very common one. So you pick your trigger, then you set your pre-trigger percentage to a very small value. I set it to 5% here because you mostly care about what happens after that digital signal goes to a high condition. I do keep a few percentage before just so I can kind of watch the startup and see what it looked like right before. I pick a sample time that gives me a long enough trace with sufficient detail. I have it set to 10 milliseconds here, which gives me an approximately 20 second trace. That may be enough. If not, I'd have to set this to a bigger value. So let's see that in action. Let me demonstrate that. All right, well, let's take a look at how we can use the scope for monitoring. Let me also just review where we are with our MoviMot in the previous session. Remember, we had switched to the alternative binary mode where we had the external fault signal. We're going to resume from there and use that to demonstrate the scope. And I do have the switch, which is simulating the fault sensor, which is connected to the counterclockwise input turned on, so we won't trigger a fault here. Let's go ahead and just do a simple monitoring operation for starters, just to see how this works. All right, to start the scope, we go over under Network to MoviMot. We right-click on it. We pick Diagnostics and Scope. The scope actually opens in a separate window. And of course, the first thing we have to do is set it up. So we're going to click the Setup button. And it asks me, do I want to start an empty record? And I'll say, sure, that sounds fine to me. OK, our setup screen has appeared. What we need to do is pick the parameters we're interested in. You can see there are some values here from the last time I was in here. Right now it's set to actual speed, set point speed, active current, and actual frequency. I'm going to keep the first three. Those are perfectly good, but I'm going to change the fourth to the DC link voltage instead. The DC link voltage can be very revealing about what's going on with the VFD, especially when you're tracing problems. So it's a useful parameter to monitor. Now I need to take a look at my sample time. It's set to one millisecond. That means it's going to take a snapshot of these parameters every one one thousandth of a second. But if I go up here where it says maximum record time, 
I only have 2,048 milliseconds. That's just two seconds. That's not nearly long enough. I'd like something about 20 seconds, so I'm going to change from one millisecond to 10, and I'm going to type it in rather than turn the dial, so I'll just type in 10, and that will change my time now to 20 seconds, 20,480 milliseconds. That's good. Now, my trigger is set to 50%. I really don't want that. What I want to happen is the trigger to start the collection, and I want almost all the data to be after the trigger. So I'm going to slide this over so the pre-trigger is just 5%, and that way the bulk of my data is post-trigger. All right, finally, I have to pick a trigger source. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use the drive enable signal, which is connected to the clockwise digital input. So I'm going to pick binary input R, which is the clockwise input. And I'm going to make sure it's set to rising edge, which means it's going from the off condition to the on. As soon as that happens, it will trigger the scope and it will start preserving the data in its buffer. Now, remember what I told you, in order to make all these changes stick, I have to do something a little odd. I have to click the Start button here and then give it about 10 seconds. What you do is you wait until the other buttons change in response to it. There we go, they've changed. Now I can click Cancel and I can close the setup screen. And now I'm ready to go. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to arm the trigger and we're going to start our drive by turning on the clockwise switch. We'll let it come up to speed. We'll let it run for a few seconds and then we'll switch it off and let it come down to a stop and we'll see what we get. All right, so to arm our trigger, we have to click this button here, start recording. So we click it and we need to wait here until our lights change. So let's pay attention to our lights. Notice they're all off at the moment. But now this one is turned to green, which means that recording is active. But notice that the trigger light is off. Trigger active is grayed out. So that means it hasn't received a trigger yet, but it is waiting for one because the green light's on. We'll notice the yellow light turn on in a few seconds. That just means the buffer is filling. There it goes and going round and round and round doing that circular buffering. As I said, the yellow light isn't terribly useful. But keep an eye on your trigger light because when I turn that switch on to start the drive, it's going to turn red because that means it received a trigger. I'm not going to show you the motor running because it doesn't do anything exciting here. Just take my word for it. I'll tell you when it's running and when it isn't. So let's go ahead and start it up and supply a trigger. Here we go. Our motor started. Notice the trigger has arrived. We're now up to speed. And now I'm going to turn it off and it's coming down. Now watch the lights. Okay, the green light just went off. What that means is the buffer finally filled up and we're done collecting data. That 20 second period is over and we can now download the data from the MoviMod into MoviTools Motion Studio. And we do that by clicking this button here, Load Inverter Data. And I warn you on a MoviMod, this is very slow. The MoviMod communicates very slowly over its USB interface, so it takes quite a long time to transfer the data. I'm going to actually edit out some of the time here so it doesn't drive you crazy watching it, but I will give you time to just see it begin so you can get a sense of about how long it should take. Okay, notice the progress bar has finally started. Through editing, I'm going to speed this up 500% so it goes by really fast. All right, there we go. So we can see our traces. These are our four parameters. Notice we have a little guide over here to remind us what the colors are and what the parameters are. So we have our actual drive speed up here. We have our set point speed. We have our motor current and we have our DC link voltage. These are our traces. So we can see this is the trigger here, the vertical line. What comes before it is the pre-trigger data, everything after it's post-trigger. What happens, the trigger arrived, the motor started up, it accelerated, it reached that constant speed of 1,505 RPM, then I switched it off, it decelerated, and it came to a stop. I'm going to show you a few things you can do here with the data. First of all, if for some reason the data isn't scaled nicely so you can see it clearly, 
You can always click this button here, Automatic Scale XY, and that will scale everything. Right now it's auto-scaled already, so it looks good. Now, if I want to change some of the scaling, I can do a variety of things to it. I can zoom in on a section of it. I can turn these dials over here to move things around. Let me turn this one here, the horizontal resolution dial. And you can see that's like adjusting the time base on a classic oscilloscope. It changes kind of the horizontal scaling. If I get really messed up and I want to go back to where I was, I can always just click auto scale here and go back. I can also change the vertical scaling for each individual trace by this pull down menu to pick what I want. For example, if I want to change actual speeds vertical scaling, I can pick it and then I can turn this dial here to zoom it up and down. And then I can turn the offset dial to bring it down here and position it maybe right on top of the set point. Now let's take a measurement from this using the cursors. Let's see if the acceleration and deceleration times are what we actually expect. Remember we set them to three and five seconds and I did a 1505 speed change, which is actually very close to a 50 Hertz change. So those times actually are the real acceleration times. So our up ramp should be three seconds and our down should be five. We can check that with the cursors. All I have to do is click here and drag and you see a little cross appears. That's one of the cursors. I'll position it at the end of the acceleration. And then I'll go over here and there's another one just at the edge of the screen. I'll grab it and I'll move it here to the beginning of the ramp. And then I'll go down to the bottom of the screen where it says difference in milliseconds. And there's our time difference, 3060 milliseconds. So in fact, this is a three second ramp. We got what we expected. Let's check the down ramp. It should be five seconds. That's about 5,000 milliseconds. I just move my cursors here. And yes, indeed, it is 5,000 milliseconds. So we got exactly what we expected. Of course, in a real application, it wouldn't necessarily be quite as clean because there'd be an actual load out there, not just a flywheel. But this gives you the idea. You can also see what the individual values are at different points along the trace. For example, if you want to see what the RPM is along here, just grab the cursor drag it onto the trace and then go over here and read the value right out of the table. And what this is saying is that the speed at that point on the trace is 1504.8 RPM. So there you go. And I encourage you to take a look at some of the other measurement possibilities at the bottom. The best way to get good with the scope is just to play with it. Now let's do something else. Let's take a look at the soft ramps. I promised you we'd look at them in the last session and we haven't done that yet. We're going to do it right now. We're going to do another trace this time using the soft ramps or the S ramp. It gives a more gentle acceleration. The scope is a great place to play with that because we can see what it looks like. We need to go back into Movi Tools and activate that ramp first. So I'm going to click down here on the Movi Tools tab and I'm going to open up parameter group one and I'm going to pick ramps, which is subgroup three. We've got our ramp set to 10 seconds for the soft ramp, but it's off. So I'm going to turn it on and set it to level two. That is moderately soft. Now it's going to take 10 seconds up and down plus a few extra seconds for the curves. So we're going to need to do a fairly long trace. I would say we want somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 seconds. We need to make a few changes. Let's go back to the scope window. And I'm going to close this window here by clicking the close box and it says, do you want to save the recorded data? And then it gives us a bit of German here, something that unfortunately didn't get translated. You'll notice this in SEW products occasionally, bits of German, but we're a German company, so that's to be expected. I'll just say nine, I don't want to save it. And I'm going to click the setup button again and say, yes, I want to begin with an empty record. And I'll wait for that to open up. All right, and I want to increase my time here. So I'm going to change my sample time from 10 milliseconds to 20. And you notice that changes this to 40,960 milliseconds, almost 41 seconds. That should be enough to show the soft ramps. Remember, I have to click start again to make this change stick. And then I have to wait till the buttons change, which takes about 10 seconds.
There we go. Now I can click cancel and I can click close and I'm ready to go. So I'm going to click start the recording, wait for the green light to come on. Okay. And I'm going to start my drive. It'll trigger immediately as soon as I turn the clockwise switch on. And I'm going to tell you what the motor's doing because remember we're using the soft ramp. So it's going to accelerate and decelerate a little differently. Here we go. All right, we are starting up very gently and slowly. We're slowly coming up to speed. Now we're up to speed. We're running smoothly. And now I'm going to switch off and decelerate. And that's taking some time too. It's a very gentle deceleration. And we've come to a stop. All right, so our buffer is still going because the green light's on, but there it just went off. So we just made it. Now we need to download our data. Let's click load data here. And again, I'm going to edit out the load time so you don't have to sit here watching it slowly load. There we go. Now you can see from looking at this that the traces definitely look a bit different. Let's look at our actual speed here. You notice why we call these S curves because they look like the letter S here. You notice it's very gentle and gradual. It accelerates up very softly. It takes a little longer than 10 seconds to reach the top. Let's put our cursors on this here and you can see what the actual time is. I'll put it at the beginning and the end. And it actually takes almost 14 seconds for the acceleration because the S parts add more time than just the straight ramp value. But you can see why we use S curves or soft curves. It definitely gives you a gentler acceleration. So there we go. I've shown you several ways to use the scope to monitor the behavior of your drive. This is one thing you may use the scope for frequently just to make sure everything's working the way you expected. Okay, well, we've seen how to do monitoring. Now let's look at how you catch faults with the scope. This is something you may have to do fairly often if you have problems that you're trying to track down. We set up the scope using MovieTools Motion Studio, then we disconnect and walk away. And then when the fault happens, we come back with our laptop, we plug in, we download the data and analyze it. How do we set up for that? Well, it's very similar to monitoring with just a few differences. First of all, again, you pick the parameters that are most likely to reveal what's causing the fault. So this would depend on the application, but you probably want the actual speed, the set point, the active current, and the DC link voltage. Those are very popular for tracking faults. There are four other parameters you can monitor as well. Then you need to pick a trigger that uniquely identifies the fault. You don't want false triggers. You don't want other things triggering the scope. You want just what actually is associated with the fault. One way that you can trigger that's extremely useful is on a specific error number. Notice the error has been set to eight. When that error occurs, the scope will capture information surrounding that event. You can pick that. You can actually have multiple sources if there are several possible things that could indicate the fault. This is kind of an area where your experience guides you, and as you use the scope more, you'll get better at this. To add a source, click the button in the trigger mode section, and that will associate it with the trigger. You'll set the pre-trigger percentage to a large value because you mostly want what happens before the trigger. So in this case, it's set to 95%. So 95% of the data comes before the trigger and 5% after. The reason you often have a few percent after is to show how the system behaves when it's shutting down. That gives you a complete picture of both the fault and the shutdown behavior. And then of course, you select a sample time that you think reaches far enough into the past to give you the clues you need to diagnose the fault. In this case, I've set it to five milliseconds. That gives me a 10 second look into the past. That may be enough, it may not. Sometimes you have to trace the fault several times and try to capture it with enough detail and time to figure it out. Again, experience really guides you as you get good at this. All right, let's demonstrate this. So 
another demonstration. Okay, we're exactly where we were at the end of our last demonstration. What we're going to do now is see how we can use the scope to monitor faults when they occur. Now, I've got a demo unit, so I can't just produce any old fault on command, but what I can do is use that external fault sensor. I've got it configured to monitor to trip a fault. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We need to go back to MoviTools Motion Studio to get some information first. So let's click on its window here. Let's assume that that external fault sensor is what we're going to be watching for. And if it occurs, it will trigger our scope. And we want to see what happened before that occurred. We need to know the error code associated with that particular fault. Also, we need to turn off our S ramp here. I don't want to use this long ramp, so I'm going to turn this off. We're going back now to our three and five second ramps, but we need to find out what the external fault sensor's numeric code is. And happily, we can find it very easily by going to the fault memory, which is under parameter group zero. And we open our most recent fault memory. So I just double click that. Remember we triggered this in the previous session and it tells us the fault code of the external terminal fault, it's 26. All right, so we needed to know that. Now let's go back to the scope. We're going to close our window here. Say, no, we don't want to save it. We're going to click Setup again. Start with a new empty record. And we'll go ahead and we'll monitor the same four parameters. But I'm going to reduce my time here. I really don't need 40 seconds worth of data for the trace. I think I'll change this to 15 milliseconds. That'll give us a 30 second trace. I need to move my pre-trigger slider because the trigger is the fault. So that's kind of the end of the events, not the beginning. So I need to move it here. I'll slide it to display 90. And what that means is 90% of the data we collect is going to be from before the trigger and 10% is after. That will allow us to see what happened up to the fault which is the trigger, and then how the drive behaves after it when it goes into shutdown. All right, so we alter our pre-trigger. Now we need to actually tell the scope what to look for for the trigger event. Now I don't want it to be triggered by the binary input anymore, so I'm going to go and change this to manual. Basically that means it won't do anything unless you manually force it to trigger by clicking the manual trigger button, which we won't do. But what I do need to do is associate an error with it. So I'm going to go over here where it says error, and I'm going to type in 26, which is the error code of interest. And the scope will now watch for that particular code. And when that comes, it will trigger the scope. I need to click start here to make my changes stick. Wait for the buttons to change. All right, now I can cancel it and close, and we're ready to go. So here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to arm my trigger by clicking the Start Recording button, and I've got to wait till the green light comes on. Okay, we're ready to go. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run the drive just by turning it on and off a few times to generate some pre-trigger data, and then I'm going to flip the external fault switch off to trip a fault, and that will trigger the scope it will take that data from its buffer and save it. And we should see everything that happened up to the trigger event and then a little bit after it. So let's start up our drive first. The drive's running. Notice it hasn't triggered the scope. We're still waiting for a trigger. So what I'm going to do now is just flip some switches on and off to kind of make the drive speed up and slow down to put some data in the buffer. And then I'm going to click my external fault. All right, up, down, up, down, up, down. Here goes the fault. And there you go, you see the light turned on. And there we go. Now let's download our data. And again, we've got our long wait, which I will edit out for you. Okay, you can see our data here. You can see all those speed up, slow down events that I generated here. Here's our trigger line here. That's where the fault occurred. Notice the drive came to a stop right away after that. 
Let's time how long this took using the cursors here. We had the rapid stop ramp set up, so it should take about half a second here. So we'll put one cursor at the end of the ramp, and we'll take the other one, and we'll put it at the beginning. And this should be about 500 milliseconds. And there it is, 480, so we're pretty close. So in fact, we can see we did indeed get a rapid stop, and we can see the events that came before the fault occurred. Of course, in real life, this would be more interesting data, and maybe we would actually see something useful in the DC link voltage and in the motor current. Right now, we don't because this wasn't really a true fault. But anyway, you can see how you can use the scope to monitor for a particular fault code and then collect data surrounding that event. And that is the end of session seven. So hopefully you found that useful and are ready now to use the scope to solve your problems. In our next session, we're going to cover some odds and ends topics. We're going to use our keypad again. We're also going to learn to do backups and we're going to play with a few tools built into MobyTools Motion Studio. And then we're going to transition to learning about field distributors in session nine. So, see you then.